Amen. And all of God's people said, Amen. Thank you for that song. And what a wonderful Savior we have. Kissed a guilty world in love. And I thank God for the kiss of heaven, His goodness and grace upon our lives. I heard the story recently of a man who established a zoo and made the entrance fee $300. No one came. Then he reduced it to $200. No one came. Down to $10. Still, no one came. And then he thought, well, I will just open the gates for free. That's what happened, and people responded in kind and filled the zoo. When they got there, he quietly locked the gate, turned loose the lions, and charged a $500 exit fee. And everyone paid the fee. As I thought about that, I read the moral of the story is that nothing in life is free. If it is, chances are that you are the product. Living at everyone else's expense costs us ultimately in the long run. We must take responsibility for ourselves and our decisions and our opportunities and make the most of them and learn to pay our own way. Learn to make the most of what God has given to us. The Bible says in Proverbs 28 and verse 1, The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion, confident, courageous. This world needs to see some confident, courageous, bold people. People who know God. The Bible says those who know God in the book of Daniel shall be strong and do great exploits. This is not a day to retreat. This is not a day to back up. This is a day to gather ourselves and to take heart as we take hold of the promise of God and go forward by faith. This is that day. This is the hour to infuse faith in this next generation as we pour the truth of God's Word into their hearts and minds. As we do this, we must keep them grounded. We want to lift them up, encourage them, and build them up, but keep them grounded, reminding them that they're responsible and accountable to God for the decisions they make and the things they do, but also teaching them the value of the opportunity God has given them, believing in them, putting confidence and courage in them. Some of you were raised that way. People told you, hey, God's got a plan for your life. There's a reason for you being here. I'm praying for you. I know that God is going to do something with your life. It seems like others, sometimes more so, were raised either with nothing said or very little or the exact opposite. What's wrong with you? Goodness gracious. You're just in the way. I mean, what were you thinking? Oh, I knew that's what you'd do. I knew that you would just bomb out. I, I knew that you would falter and fail, and, or that's what you're going to do. What a sad, tragic way for children to be treated. God wants us to take heart and learn from this today. As we take our Bibles and stand, I want you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to read two verses. Let's stand together, please. You have a Bible there in your pew. If you would like to use that, you're welcome to. And you'll see it here before you. Because I want us to see what God's Word says. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is speaking to this young pastor, Timothy. And he's 
infusing faith in him. And as we think about this, I think about the lessons that God wants us to learn. The Bible says, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, let's read it aloud together. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Thank you. you. may be seated. Think about what God is saying to this young pastor through his mentor, the Apostle Paul. Stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. The gift that God had for Timothy did not come through Paul, but Paul put his hands on him symbolically in recognition that God had his hand upon this young man's life. God had called him and gifted him. God had equipped him. God had a specific purpose for his life. And so he says, I want you to stir up the gift of God which is in you. The word stir or the expression stir up means to rekindle. I mean take heart. Get encouraged. Be reminded that you're here for a reason and God is at work in your life. Timothy was up against it. He had certain challenges going on in his life. He was timid by nature. And so he needed encouragement, not someone to say, well, what's wrong with you? Why haven't you dealt with this yet? I mean, why are you even thinking about leaving? Because he, he wanted out. And you can see this earlier where the Bible says, abide still, stay there in Ephesus where God has you. Get settled, get planted and do what God is giving you to do. He needed someone to help him get his bearings and shore him up so that he was not double-minded or tossed to and fro or unsettled or unstable. But the Apostle Paul came alongside of him and said, see what God has given you. See what God has done for you. See through eyes of faith what God can do with your life yet. Stir up the gift of God which is in thee. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 14, he said, Neglect not the gift that is in thee. Don't be careless or casual with what God has given you, equipped you with. The gift, the divine endowment or enabling that is from God. This is what God has for your life. Romans 11 verse 29 says, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. The word calling means invitation and vocation, a call unto God to know Him, to walk with Him, and then to do His will for your life. They're without repentance. God's not going to give up on you. Don't you Give up on Him. Trust God. Rekindle. Get refreshed and renewed in what God has given you. God has placed you here. And this is what God wants you to lay hold of and move forward and make the most out of. As we think about this, write some things down here this morning, if you will, especially there in your listening guide. Stir up the gift of God which is in you, number one, because of those who have prayed for you. Think of those who've gone before you, those who have poured into you, but they prayed for you. The Bible says here, notice this in verse 5. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee. Unfeigned means without hypocrisy. It's genuine. It's real. Which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Think about what Paul is saying here. As there are those that were in Timothy's life who loved him, who taught him, who prayed for him. It's amazing. He talks about his mother and his grandmother. They were Jewish women who both heard the gospel and turned to Christ in their heart by faith. Converted to Christianity, they were teaching this son, this grandson, 
who Jesus Christ is. Hold your place, but look over in chapter 3. The Bible says in verse number 14, But continue thou on the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. He learned them at the knee of his mother, his grandmother, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus from a child. He was loved and taught and prayed for. So many of us have had loved ones pour into us, teach us, love us, care for us, and pray for us. Stir up this gift of God which is in you. I believe this could apply to us all, not just as a young adult, but as a middle-aged adult, an older adult. We're still here. That means God's not finished with us. What is in your heart to do for God before you leave this world? Do you believe God will enable you to do that? With God, nothing is impossible. God is able to take you who you are, where you are. As God reminds you that there are those who've gone before you and they have prayed for you. You're going to have to humble yourself before God and stir up that gift which is in you. Get renewed in your understanding that God, you put me in this world for a reason. I'm not here by accident or by mistake. There's a divine purpose and plan for my life. Maybe there's been some things that have interrupted that for a time or maybe put that on hold, but I'm still here and you're still God. And Lord, I want to serve you yet. Oh God, help me to take hold of your promise. And oh God, help me to have that desire kindled in my heart anew. As we think about Timothy, his mother married a Greek man, and that explains why Timothy was not circumcised as a young boy. But Paul had Timothy circumcised before they began their missionary journeys so he wouldn't be a stumbling block to the Jews that they would minister to. Think about that. In one sense, he didn't have everything that some would think he would need to do what God had given to do. But though it didn't happen at one season of life, it did happen at another, and God used him in a wonderful way. I, I don't know what seasons of life have come and gone for you. I know mine are coming and going. They're getting gone. As much as I love the fall and look forward to it, I thought just recently, I wonder how many falls I have left. I'm glad God doesn't tell us that because, wow, that'd be hard to handle. But I wonder, you come to a place to where you realize that I am mortal. I'm not going to live forever on this earth. I am dying little by little, day by day. And sometimes I realize that just intimately. <laughs> I'm not what I used to be physically. But I am still here. Aren't you thankful that God allows new beginnings and fresh starts? He's not a respecter of persons. He'll forgive you. He'll hear your prayer. Stir up that gift that is in you. Stir up that desire. You know, I always wanted to do this. The Shepherd's Place Children's Home started by Brother Miss Citro years ago. They served young people and served in ministry for years up in Massachusetts, and then they retired from uh, pastoring and moved down here, and their son said, Dad, if you could do anything, what would you do? Because in retirement, they got a little restless and said, I don't know, we, we may have a little gas in the tank yet. He said, I want to do something. He said, what is the one thing y'all would do if you could do it? He said, being your mother always had in our heart to start a children's home. And he said, let's start looking for land. And God worked it out, and the land that we have now down at Trinity Church Road is the land that God 
provided for them to start the Shepherd's Place Children's Home. That's something they did in their retirement years. What is in your heart to do yet before you leave this world? You know what the devil tells you? He's told me this when I was a younger pastor. You're just too young. You're just too young. You know what he's trying to tell me now? You're too old. That ship has sailed. You know, that, that stage of life has already passed you. I mean, come on. Isn't that right? He is a deceiver. He's a liar. Don't listen to him. Listen to God. Stir up the gift that is in you. That calling of God, that divine enabling. What would you do for God today? You say, this is what I would do for God. I had a young man talk to me the other day. He's faced many challenges in life. And he said, but this is in my heart to do yet. And I said, well, two things remember. Oftentimes your calling will come out of your passion. What is that true passion that God has put in your heart? But it also will come out of your pain. He said, I want to help people in this regard because I know what it's like to struggle in that area. What is God putting in your heart to do? Let the Holy Spirit, through His Word today, stir it up in you. I was talking to some men yesterday. We've got to get a team together and go up here to the mountains and spend some time helping these folks. What's that going to look like? Some of you men, that, that would light your fires. Like, yeah, I'd love to go up there and just roll up my sleeves and help these folks out. There's something you can do for God there's something God has put in your heart. But perhaps there's someone here who would head that up and say, I'll be responsible for that. I'll get that together. We can move forward. We've got to help these folks. That's who we are. We serve God. We serve others. Our life is not our own. We belong to God and we've given ourselves to God. We want our lives to be used up in the service of God and others. Stir up the gift of God, which is in thee. Number one, because of those who've prayed for you. Number two, because of what God has and has not given you. The Bible says, notice verse 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. Don't hold back because of fear. Don't be intimidated. <laughs> who, who am I to think God could use someone like me? I mean, I, I don't have much experience. I, I just don't have what others have. Friend, don't look at your insufficiency. Look at God's all-sufficiency. God uses the weak things, not the wise, not those who think they're enough or more than enough without God, those who know they're nothing without Him, those who say, Lord, I can't, but you can. And I'm just going to trust myself to you. And, and God, I read that one day, God chooses the weak things. And I said, wow, there it is. I qualify. God can use someone like me. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. God will strengthen me. It's a divine capacity, a divine endowment, and it's a divine enabling God will enable us to do what He's given us to do. And He's not given us a spirit of fear and insecurity and just being overwhelmed with the challenge and, and just crumbling in the face of it. I can't and stopping there. Where we can't, God can. He can. God can. And He's more than enough to do what we need done in our lives. The Holy Spirit gives us the power to love God and others as well as the strength to control ourselves. Think about that. The Holy Spirit has given us that dynamic to choose what life we will live and what we will feed, the flesh, the sin nature, or the spirit to make wise choices by the help and enabling of God. And he says, God is not giving you a spirit of fear. Where you have fear, you have a lack of faith. Where you have faith, you have a lack of fear because perfect love casts out fear. Fear has torment. 
It'll drive you crazy. If you live every day, oh no, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen in this world. I'm going to wring my hands every day. Did you hear this? You hear? By the way, some of us need to hear less news and get in the Bible and read God's good news. Isn't that right? Because if you're not careful, you'll live in this perpetual mindset, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And by the way, I know it's bad out there. I'm not naive. I, I keep in touch with what's going on. But I will tell you, uh, all the things that are going on out here, of all of that, there's a God in heaven who's on his throne, and it could not be going on without his knowledge. So he knows not only what's going on, but he knows who you are and where you are and what's going on in your life, and he'll be faithful to you. His grace will be sufficient for you. That's what you've got to take hold of and be reminded of today. There is a God in heaven. I want to set my affection on things above. I want to put my mind on the Lord because God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God has given me confidence and courage, divine Holy Spirit power and enabling the love of God, a sound, clear thinking mind. One writer said, you can pick what you ponder. You didn't choose your parents or siblings. You don't determine the weather. There are many things in life over which you have no choice. But the greatest activity of life is well within your domination. You can choose what you think about. You can be the air traffic controller of your mental airport. Thoughts circle above, coming and going. If one of them lands, it's because you gave it permission. If it leaves, it is because you directed it to do so. Do you want to be joyful tomorrow? Then sow the seeds of joy today. Count your blessings. Hide God's Word in your heart. Pray. Sing songs of adoration and praise unto God. Spend time encouraging others. Do you want to guarantee tomorrow's misery? then wallow in a mental mud pit of self-pity or guilt or anxiety today. Assume the worst. Beat yourself up. Rehearse your regrets. Complain to other complainers. Our thoughts have consequences. Your challenge is not your challenge. Your challenge is the way you think about your challenge. Your problem is not your problem. It is the way you look at it. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Stir up the gift of God which is in you. God wants us to do that because of those who prayed for us, because of what God has and has not given us. And then number three, because God has a purpose for your life. Verse 8, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose. Underline that. His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Paul says, this is God's purpose for my life, to preach and to point people to God. That's God's appointment for me. I am serving Him according to His divine purpose. All of our children need to know that God has a plan for their lives. God has a plan for you. I'm praying for you that you'll follow God. I remember picking one of my sons up from work one day, and he was struggling. And I told him, I said, son, the adversary, Satan, is waging a war for your future. I said, that's what's going on. I said, if you're not careful, you're going to let him win, but you have a choice. You don't have to. He wants to rob you of all that God has for you. Because the thief cometh to steal, kill, and destroy. And I said, I'm praying that God will help you to see this. 
what's going on. And God did a genuine work in his life. I want to tell you, we do have an adversary who's real. And he wants this generation of young people growing up in Christian homes to be in homes where mom is anxious and, and upset and discontent. You know, the house is never good enough. The, you know, and then the dad is overworked and underpaid and he's aggravated with everything at work and so he's just down and discouraged and defeated and mom is too, but yet we go to church because it's our duty. It's something that we just think we should do because we were taught to do that. And then they grow up and think, hey, there's got to be a better way to live than this. May God help us to reverse that and turn that around. You know what? It should be that, hey, without God, we should be thinking, there's got to be a better way to live than this. Because with God, there is a better way. There is a purpose. Think about that. God has a purpose for my life. Children ought to have that instilled in them. I thought about something I'm going to incorporate in our chapels here. We have elementary chapel, we have middle school chapel, and then we have high school chapel. And here's something we're going to start saying in chapels, like a miniature mini statement of faith because I want these children to memorize it because they'll be saying it when they're 80 years old, all right? They're going to still be saying this. It's like a little mini statement of faith, and here it is. We believe the Bible is God's Word. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. The Holy Spirit lives within us. We are committed to fulfill His purpose. Boy, if children would just get that in their heart, they'd never get away from that. Isn't that right? To fulfill His purpose for our lives. God has a purpose. God has a plan. God is at work. Number four, stir up the gift that is in thee because God will keep you. Verse 12, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep guard by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Think about it. God isn't going to give up on His calling for you, Timothy. Don't you give up on His calling for you. You keep what God has entrusted to you, what God has blessed you with. Take it and develop it. Hone it. Make the most of it. This is where God has you, Timothy, and what He's equipped you to do. Get with it. Get it done. I want to tell you, we know that when we do God's will, that God goes before us and God goes with us and God will keep us. We have a generation of children need, who need to know that there is not only a God, but He is a personal God who cares for us. And He's going to take care of you. How many of you have ever had a need and you prayed and you know, you know in your heart that God heard your prayer and met that need? God met that need. How many of you know that? You know that? Tell your children about that. Tell your grandchildren about that. They need to hear that from you. They need to hear how you got saved. That was a message in chapel on Friday. Such a wonderful challenge to grandparents. They need to hear about your family history and, and they need to hear how God has worked in your life and they need to hear you pray for them by name. They need to hear that from you. They need to know how you met God and prayers that God has answered and needs that He's met in your own life because God will keep His own. One has said, where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved. And then lastly, number five, stir up the gift that is in thee because of those who will encourage you. How many of you have someone come to your mind right now that has been a true encouragement in your life? You just think about it. They encouraged you somehow. They were maybe a parent, maybe a grandparent, family member, maybe just a friend, somebody at school, maybe a teacher somewhere, maybe a boss, a coworker but they were always encouraging to me. Paul experienced that, and I won't labor it here, but he was forsaken by so many. But one in particular, 
the Bible says in verse 16, Onesiphorus, he oft refreshed Paul, encouraged him, and uh, ministered to him. I'm sure fed him and, and, uh, and befriended him. And the Bible says he was not ashamed of Paul being imprisoned and the things that he had faced in his life. And sometimes people are ashamed of what they've been through. You ought to treat them in such a way to where you look beyond that and see them as a person. And you don't let that define them or your relationship with them. And that's what he's saying here. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. Go out of your way to help people. That's what we're talking about, the mountains here. Go out of your way. He sought me. He tracked me down. He did everything he could to help me. That's a true friend, right? And he says here, The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things, how many.